uh, Charles Adams from the Arizona State Museum, who is the director of the Himalavi Research Program, which is, to the rest of us, uh, Winslow, Arizona, for 25 years? Since uh, 85. Since 85. So 28 years, I guess. Yeah. And uh, Dr. Adams is also my dissertation advisor, um, whom I worked for at Himalavi for probably about 12 years at least. So Seems like 20, but it was probably 12. Thanks, Chuck. So without further ado, I will turn things over to Dr. Adams, and away we go. <laughs> well, thank you all for coming. Um, it's great to be here. Um, I've come to a number of these, and um, I'm really thankful that I am the speaker and not here to try to get a seat, because uh, I would have had to have come a half an hour or so earlier. Uh, as Doug mentioned, I've, I've been working along with uh, my colleague, Rich Lang, who's right over here. Um, in, the, uh, <laughs> uh, in, this, in the Winslow area for almost 30 years. Um, is there anybody who has not driven that stretch between uh, Flagstaff and Gallup? Doesn't know that area, huh? One person, okay. Well, um, as you know, after, after you leave the trees near Flagstaff, you'll notice that there's really not a lot of vegetation. Basically grassy, uh, a few shrubs, that sort of thing. Um, and what that means is that it's really hard to make a living as a hunter and gatherer on the Colorado Plateau um, because there's not a lot of options out there. So what hunter and gatherers do to try to compensate for that is they try to find places where there is more variability. Um, in the southeast here, it's usually mountains that provide that. So you know we have all this uh, amazing variability in terms of plant communities on the mountains here. On the plateau, it's uh, it can be mountains, but it's more typically canyons or you know, areas where there's uh, more water. And this is the situation that we, have, um, that, that we have in the area that we've been working in recently, which is called Rock Art Ranch. Um, hopefully all of you got the handouts or have access to handouts. Um, the first page is, uh, shows you kind of the area that we've been working in. Uh, the various Homolavi sites. I'll talk a little bit about Homolavi toward the end of this uh, presentation. I'm going to focus more on the area that's called Rock Art Ranch, um, which is in that little, the, the larger and smaller rectangles where Rich and I have been working the last three years with the field school. The reason I'm talking about the um, topographic variability is if you look at the next couple of maps um, that uh, show a more detailed perspective of the Rock Art Ranch area. One of the characteristics of Rock Art Ranch, which is different than the, the Homolavi site area, is that there are a lot of canyons that go through that area. They're not particularly deep, um, but they provide enough um, water that's stored in those canyons that you get a lot of different types of plants. And so my expectation going out in that area um, is that when I'm looking for people who are hunters and gatherers, even if they're starting to grow corn, they're still primarily hunters and gatherers, really agriculturalists, that I'm probably going to find them in areas where they have access to more plant resources. Uh, so if you look at the second map where it says archaic basket maker 2, um, at least hopefully it says that, yep, archaic basket maker 2 sites, uh, you'll notice how concentrated they are along canyons, which is where we expect them to be. That's because of those resources I just mentioned. The next map uh, illustrates what happens once people uh, begin to get adapted to farming. And uh, areas of plant diversity are not so important. Um, they're looking for places where they can grow corn, uh, arable land. And oftentimes, these areas which are very monotonous in terms of plants are really ideal areas. They're sand and things like that, really ideal areas for, for farming. So if we look at the distribution of sites for the, what's said called Pueblo 2 and Pueblo 3, you'll notice that, that you know, they're, not, they're near the canyon, but they're all over the place because they're, they're using the uh, terrain much differently. 
So what does this have to do with migration? Um, gosh, I'm, I'm sure that there's some, something that has to do with it. I'll try to think of it. Um, the, uh, the interesting thing about the Rock Art Ranch area, and why we, one of the reasons we got interested in it is because uh, there's this really magnificent uh, rock art site there. Um, called Chevron Steps, and the back page of your handout is just one of several thousand petroglyphs in that canyon. And those petroglyphs are primarily uh, what we call basket maker two on the plateau, people who are just experimenting with corn and, and, and learning about growing corn and agriculture, and groups slightly before that, the, the late archaic. And almost all of the rock art in this area is from that time period. So our hypothesis was that there were probably people there who were doing this. Um, and that they, if they had the time to do this and they were interested in doing it, they probably were staying there for some period of time. Uh, so, uh, so part of the reason that we wanted to do research in, er in this area is to contextualize this, this fantastic petroglyph site. And Chevlon Canyon in itself is an amazing uh, place, and it's on those two maps. Uh, Chevlon is, has actually has running water going through it all the time. Uh, the rancher out there, named Brantley, who's named Brantley Baird, uh, moved out to the ranch in 1946. So he's been there a while. So he has a pretty good history and knowledge of what the area has been like through really dry periods, really wet periods, dust bowl type conditions, that the springs that feed that Chevlon Creek, Chevlon Canyon, have never dried up, even for a day. So this was a reliable area to get water. So uh, we expected to find these sites that we found, and there are 28, 25 of them actually on this map of the, of, uh, of these uh, late archaic, early agricultural sites, we expected to find sites there. But what we wanted to know also is where are these people coming from? And because um, they probably didn't all just blossom there and hang out there for thousands and thousands of years. Uh, typically, hunter and gatherer groups move to resource locations where resources are better, food resources are better. One of the ways that we can trace where people come from is through something that archaeologists um, have borrowed, of course, from other people. Uh, it's something called technological style. Um, it's also uh, referred to as enculturation. The, one of the main uh, researchers in this area is an employee of uh, Archaeology Southwest, Jeff Clark, and um, did, did his dissertation work on this. And what that means is that um, when you're living in a, a community, you're living in a small society of, these people were always living in small societies, households or your, your kinship, small groups, social groups, um, you learn from those people how to make things. So if you're a uh, hunter and gatherer, you're making baskets, you're making sandals, you're making spear points. How do you learn how to do that? You learn it from your mother or your father or somebody in your social group. And that's just the way you do it. So if you think about yourself and your own lives, you know, and the social groups you, you grew up in, um, you know, there are certain ways you do things. That's just the way you're supposed to do it. You know, and when, when you meet somebody who doesn't do it that way, you think, well, they're a little odd. Um, that's not the way you're supposed to do it. Um, and so, uh, so this is, this is uh, called enculturation. So you can imagine uh, somebody making a basket. There are a lot of details in making a basket of how to weave it, what plants to select, how to dye them, what designs to use, all these sorts of things. You learn them from your social groups. Uh, how to make a spear point. You do the same sort of thing. Uh, there's a second aspect of this uh, related to this uh, enculturation. So you know, you're, you're within, enculturated, you're within your, your social group, your cultural group. 
So second aspect of that, that has to do with uh, the sequence that, the, of steps that you use to manufacture something, which I just talked about. Um, chain de uh, l'apatois is, is uh, the term for it, and it's the chain of events that you use to make something. You're making a spear point, you're gonna do it in a certain sequence of moves. And that's gonna be different than the people on the other side of the mountain, or they're gonna make their baskets differently. So bring, to bringing this back to the research we're doing at Rock Art Ranch, uh, we've recovered 101 spear projectile points, and those are um, presented in table form. Um, there are three tables. Um, it just seemed impossible for me to do a talk without some props of some sort. Uh, and also, just to help you, uh, uh, you know, follow what the discussion is. So uh, we, we were interested in those projectile points, uh, what types they are, because uh, from a lot of research that archaeologists have done for the last hundred years or so, we have a general idea about where um, spear points and arrow points originate or are the most concentrated. And, when, and then we also know uh, what the material is that people use. And one of the things we were interested in, are they using local materials to make the spear points? Are they bringing materials in from someplace else? And uh, so the, uh, the first table uh, kind of describes that in a general way. Uh, the other things on this first table I should point out to you are dates. It gives you some dates about time periods that we're talking about. You know, I said 3,000 years. I'm really going to be talking closer to seven or eight or 9,000 years. I hope it doesn't disappoint you. Um, the other thing that's interesting in this table, to me, is on the right side of it, uh, is the frequency of projectile points per time, amount of time in that period. So you'll see that uh, in the early peri earliest periods, it's one er we have one for every 600 years, and this doesn't mean literally that there was one. This is just what we've picked up, and you know they may have all been there within a 10-year period. We don't know. Uh, the second one drops to one every 163 years, one out of 106, and then one out of 37. What this means is that there's an intensification of use over time of, of this Rock Art Ranch area. People are spending more time there. And, uh, and then the, um, the material category, which is further described on the second um, table, talks about the various charts and all these material types that people can make projectile points out of. And if you'll notice, um, only nine out of the 101 are made out of literally local material. 32, and those would be the, the uh, petrified wood and the chalcedony, 32 of them are made, were made within about a 25, 35 mile radius and brought into that area. The rest of them, the other 60, are probably from a distance farther than that. So that tells us people are coming in from fairly long distances, and if you look at the time period, over long periods of time. But they're also, through that same long period of time, occasionally using local resources. That also means to us then that people are staying there for a while. They're using material. They're familiar with where material is. They have an understanding of that landscape. So they're not, when they come into there, they, they have some familiarity with it. So it, that suggests that it's part of what they do maybe on an annual basis. They come through this area, spend some time, focus on those little drainages where there are more plants available. Uh, there are also magnificent variety of grasses that grow in the Rock Art Ranch area, uh, dozens and dozens of them. Tremendous food resource at certain times of the year, in either the spring or later in the summer. So the, 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 the times that people might be coming and visiting this area. The, other, the next table then talks a little bit about where these spear points, table number, well they're not numbered, but the third table, uh, where these spear points or groups who make these types of these styles of spears typically come from. So if you uh, look at the table, you'll notice that the earliest spear points on this, the, uh, the ones that we call Paleo Indian points, but are here Lancelot, Plano, and Scotts Bluff points, 
all of those typically, all the early ones typically are coming from the east or northeast. They're coming from the Rio Grande area, northwest New Mexico, places like that. That's where these groups are coming into this area. Um, if we look later on, we'll notice that um, uh, sort of in this middle archaic, the end of the middle archaic period, there's a lot of people coming, starting to come in from the north or northwest, people coming from long distances out of the Great Basin area. Um, and then also uh, later on in this uh, middle archaic and getting into the early archaic period, we suddenly see a, a upsurge of projectile point types that are characteristic of this area, southeastern Arizona. Things called San Pedro, where would that name come from, I wonder? Cortaro, uh, Cienega, those points are all named from this area and are concentrated in this area, yet we find a lot of them up in the Rock Art Ranch area. Um, and some of them are being locally made in the Rock Art Ranch area, or they're being made out of petrified wood coming from the petrified forest. Um, or they may be making, they're coming out of material that's probably coming out of the mountains between here and southeastern Arizona. It's at the time that these points arrive in this area that we see agriculture also arrive. Um, southeastern Arizona, the Tucson area, as you may know, probably you all know because you're interested in archaeology, has some of the earliest, enough the earliest corn in the southwest, 4, 000, over 4,000 years old. Tremendous communities are, are growing up and, and use of the landscape for canals and all sorts of things are happening in this area. There's a, there are a lot of people who believe that the introduction of agriculture on, into the western Colorado Plateau, basically Arizona, Colorado Plateau, part of Arizona, that that agriculture was introduced by people living in this area, in southeastern Arizona. And that's based on uh, styles of basketry, um, styles of pit structures, pit houses that they were building, and um, also the, the, the type of spear points that we're making. So it looks like to me that we have pretty strong indications of people coming who, who were familiar with this, these spear point types, um, moving into the Rock Art Ranch area and spending a lot more time. So these, these sites that I have with these black dots on here date this, this sort of late archaic best maker too. That is that period. That is the beginning of agriculture, the San Pedro period, about 1200 BC or so. Uh, at the same time, we see in the, these sites, uh, we've done some testing in them, excavations in them. We, find, we found a pit house that dates to this period pre-ceramic, we found uh, bell-shaped storage pits, we found um, stone-lined storage pits, uh, and we found maize in, in one site that dates 750 BC. Pretty early, pretty early for this area. Uh, the other dates we've gotten from uh, radiocarbon uh, collections from features were 100 BC and almost 500 AD. So that, that's kind of that range of this Basket Maker II period, late archaic Basket Maker II period, when people are experimenting and then accommodating themselves to agriculture and then really get, becoming dependent on it. So these sites that we see are not only being used for, as hunting and gathering areas, but they're perfect, these little canyons, for gardens growing corn because they have a lot of moisture in the sand there um, we, my colleague and I, Eric Force, uh, retired from the USGS, got, I convinced him to come up and dig holes in these uh, canyons full of sand. Um, you can always get geologists to dig holes in, 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 in quaternary deposits. So we dug holes in, in these two canyons, one's called um, Chimney Canyon, the other one's called Bell Cow Canyon. And when we got down about a meter and a half into these things, they're full of water. There's actually standing water in the bottom of these canyons. Amazing, potable water. And we didn't even get close to the bottom of these things. So they could have easily gotten water out of those by dig digging simple wells, or 
they could have used that water to, to water their plants. And then uh, during times of the year, water comes down those canyons, replenishes that water, and also provides water for gardens. So we, we think that there's a, a likelihood that they were doing that. God, I'm going to talk for an hour here. I better speed it up. <sighs> OK. Um, so enough of the pre-ceramic people. Uh, let's, let's look at the ceramic period in the Rock Art Ranch area. Uh, we have two, two major ceramic periods. There's the good old Basket Maker III period, which dates from about, well, in the Rock Art Ranch area, probably from about 600 to 800 AD. We have two very large communities in, on Rock Art Ranch in a, in a smaller site with some pit houses. These are big sites, lots of pit houses. And the pottery they have is black and white pottery or black and gray pottery and gray pottery, gray, plain, plain, plain gray pottery. Uh, one thing I didn't touch on very heavily, but I will now, is the, the pottery that people use for their everyday use, for cooking, for storing, what we call utility wares, is the pottery that is least likely to be affected, it's least likely to change. It's, it's got that technological attributes of how you make a pot well hidden in that. So if you find pottery uh, in an area that um, looks just like pottery in another area, um, one of the things you can do is just determine how it was made. Uh, so the pottery that we find in these Basket Maker 3 sites is all gray and whiteware pottery. The only place that that's made, it, they, they don't make it locally, they don't have the clays to make it locally, it's made north. 30 to 70 miles north of the Rock Art Ranch areas where this pottery is made. My belief is these people migrated down from that area, established these communities. They're making pit houses. We've, we've excavated some of these in the Mullaby area. Pit houses that look just like the ones to the north. Um, and they have this, this utilitarian pottery and decorated pottery identical to the north. Looks like people came into this area during this period and settled in this area and were successful because they had large communities for long periods of time. Then we have a, a hiatus there for about 200 years from the early 800s to maybe as late as 1100, certainly the late 1000s. And then we have a repopulation, which is shown on that map, P2, P3 map, uh, of a lot of small pueblos coming into this area and settling. Uh, we have a couple of dozen of them. And um, by the 1100s and the 1200s, what we notice about these people is their utility pottery, it's not gray, it's mostly brown. Almost all brown, and, it's, and the corrugations are obliterated on this. People who do that, live in the mountains of Arizona. They're, they're muggy own, what we call muggy own people. No Pueblo person would be caught dead making orange or brown colored pottery. It would be just embarrassing. Same way with the people in the mountains. They wouldn't, they wouldn't make any gray pottery. They make brown pottery. Uh, so it looks like the people that have moved into this Rock Art Ranch area are coming in from the south, southeast area. And uh, we're doing some work in another site that Rich is excavating called the Multi Kiva site, which is that little box on your first map. And that also has a lot of brown pottery. It has some gray pottery too. So they're still exchanging, but the, the, the predominance is brown pottery, which as archeologists we believe really represents who these people are. That's what they're using every day. That's what they're making there. Um, but there's also decorated pottery that shows up in these sites. In the 1100s and early 1200s, that decorated pottery is all coming from the north, where they, the original people in the Basque Maker III period came from. So they're, they're maintaining connections with those people. Um, sometime in the early to mid 1200s, that shifts, and suddenly they're trading decorated pottery from people to the east, over in the, say, Snowflake, um, St. John's area. These are social relationships that they're creating and, and connecting. They, they, they're maintaining relationships with people at some distance, maybe for marriage partners, maybe they're exchanging food, resources, the people 
uh, in the Rock Art Ranch and farther north might have more access to turkeys and those sorts of things. Um, we don't know what they were trading, but they're retaining these social relationships because it's really important if you're a small community to have connections and know who your neighbors are. It's pretty handy today, too, actually, to know who your neighbors are. So, interesting. So we have people coming from the north and south, and then um, around 1250 or thereabouts, people stopped living in the Rock Art Ranch area. Uh, so I want to shift now to uh, the Hualabi area. Um, uh, we've been work we worked, started working on Rock Art Ranch in 2011. We worked in the Homolovy area and the Homolovy sites. Rich started there in 1984. We wrapped things up for the most part in 2006. Um, and we excavated a lot, about 170 rooms and lots of outside areas. We have millions of artifacts. If you want something to do in your spare time, talk to Rich or me. We got stuff for you to do. We'd love to have you volunteer. Um, in, in the Homolovy area, we have an interesting thing going on. There's not really very much pre-ceramic stuff in the Homolovy area. We have one hearth that we found uh, while the visitor center was being uh, built, and that hearth had a little corn in it down pretty deep below where the visitor center is, and it dates about 200 BC. But that's about it. We have a few points and things like that, but we don't really have the settlements we have in the Rock Art Ranch area. That's because it's a very different landscape out there. It's, it, it has a big valley, the Little Colorado River flows through there. It is a river in there, it actually has water, partly due to Chevron Creek. It has a big flood plain. It's much more suitable to farmers than it is to hunters and gatherers. Uh, so we have f people who, who are farming that show up about 600 AD, and they periodically use the terraces overlooking the Little Colorado River from about 600 to the early 1200s, 1225 or 1230. Interestingly enough, we have the same hiatus of <laughs> occupation there that we have in the Rock Art Ranch area. Doesn't seem to be really anybody around between about eight, early 800s to the late ten, mid to late 1000s. You know. Don't really know why, we, and it's not part of this talk. Um, the early people, the, the Basque Maker Three people, um, look somewhat like the people in the Rock Art Ranch area, but they're not staying there nearly as long. Their communities are much smaller, but they also have the gray pottery coming from the north. These people also are coming from the north, settling along the Little Colorado River, uh, probably during times of drought up in the upper air, uh, higher elevation areas where they don't have a river, they move down closer to the river where they have a source of water. They can hand water plants, have drinking water, and things like that. We get into the late Pueblo period, well, the middle Pueblo period, from about uh, late, late 1000s to about 1225. Uh, the people in the Homolovi area are still basically using gray pottery. And they're still, they're using the same whiteware pottery that's being traded into those at Rock Art Ranch. But they're actually still moving down along the Little Colorado River. So they're very different people, for the most part, than what we see at Rock Art Ranch. 10 miles, 15 miles away. Uh, there's one exception to that. And in the early 1200s, late 1100s, a Pueblo moves into the Little Colorado River area. We call it Cresswell Pueblo. Um, and it, it's very different from the other s settlements that are uh, in, along the Little Colorado River in the Mullaby area. It, uh, the, those other settlements, they're still actually living in pit houses. Um, and they don't have Pueblo structures made out of stone. They have what are called wattle and daub type of structures made out of brush and adobe. The Cresswell people are built, built their Pueblo out of stone. Interestingly enough, the, most of their, dec their utility pottery is brownware. And the Pueblo and the pottery looks very similar to what we see in Rock Art Ranch. So it looks like one of those groups living in the Rock Art Ranch area, or maybe some other place uh, up toward the more to the south where it's a little higher and wetter, moved into that area. They had these social relationships already established because they had been trading for that pottery. They were allowed to move into that area seemingly at the same time that people were from the north were living in that area. So that's really interesting. 
Um, and then um, the latest uh, occupation that we have in the Hamolavi area, uh, those famous big pueblos, those, those ancestral Hopi pueblos that are on that first map, uh, the Hamolavi pueblos, uh, and, and they date basically from about 1260 to 1400. Well, the interesting thing about those pueblos is, as far as we can tell, when the small pueblos stopped being occupied, seems to be about 1225, the first big Hamolavi Pueblo comes in about 1260, there didn't seem to be anybody living, at least in a permanent sense, along the Little Colorado River. <clears throat> Uh, so the, by virtue of that, all of the people living in those Hamolavi sites, and there are 3,285 rooms, all those people are migrants because there was nobody there. Big migration. Most of those people, on the basis of, again, technological style, things like this. So I have a couple of pictures of pots here because you know you can't do a Southwest talk without pictures of pots. <laughs> so the one on the front is a, a style that's made up in the Hopi mesas uh, in, at the time period shown. It's called Huckabee Black on Orange. The one on the other side is made in the Homolavi area, uh, same time period, it's called Tuyuka Black on Orange. You'll notice that they both have these banding lines around the edges of them. That's very distinctive to Hopi beginning in the mid 1200s. Nobody else does that um, in the north. Now, the, the people in the White Mountain area are doing it, <clears throat> um, but they're using a very different uh, recipe for, for making pottery. And they have these little line breaks in these. The ones on, uh, in the White Mountain area, the White Mountain Redwares, usually don't have line breaks. So what this tells us is, uh, is that people familiar with this pottery making tradition showed up in the Winslow area and continued to make that pottery making tradition, but they did it on local material. So what you do when you move from one area to another, if you're a migrant, you have these ways of doing things, these technological styles, you're kind of stuck with the local material. You know, you, you, know, you, you have all the material you need where you came from, but the clays are different, maybe this, the material you add to the clays are different, uh, you have different firewood, you have different plants maybe that you can use to paint, even the minerals may be slightly different. This results in something that looks different and yet they were making it the same way. They're using the same techniques of, of, of you know, the direction maybe that they're wrapping the coils to make the pot, the way they finish the pot, uh, the way they polish it, the way they uh, paint it, uh, that sequence of, of of uh, how things are made applies really well to pottery because there's a certain way where you come from that you, you paint a pot. If it's a polychrome with black paint and white outline, well, um, you know, sometimes you might paint the black and then you might outline it later or you might do the outlining and not finish the black. There is a sequence of ways to do it and you can see it on these pots how they do, do those. There was a master's thesis that, that tracked that. Uh, so we, we can tell by the fact of the pottery, also these people are making Pueblo, their, their rooms look the same, the, the, the layout of the room, their domestic space is the same, their ceremonial structures are the same, their kivas, they're building them the same way as people from the north. So we have a really strong indication that these people migrated from the north. However, we do have a few sneaky indications that people also migrated from the southeast. Um, there is a great kiva, a rectangular great kiva at Homolavi 3. It's not, it's not on any of your handouts, um, um, but it has been published, a, 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 a monograph on Homolavi 3. A rectangular great kiva, those things do not occur to the north in the Hopi country. They're very common in the mountains, over again in Snowflake and Alpine, Spring, Springerville, places like that. Uh, the kivas and things at the Hamolavi 3 look a little different than the ones at the other sites. It's a pretty good indication that at least a small group of people from southeast came in and established or moved in with people maybe from the north into Hamolavi 3. Uh, later on, you've all heard of those Salado folks, right? 
Yeah, moving around all over the place, spreading their pottery all over the place. Probably, almost certainly, Patrick Lyons um, has done a lot of work as well as, as Jeff Clark. These are people who are migrating from the Colorado Plateau, Pueblo people. Um, we see a surge of them coming into one of the settlements called Chevlon in the late 1300s. We see what is perfectly good Roosevelt Redware in every way that you can imagine, except they're making it on local clay and pottery. That's a good indicator that people with all the knowledge about how to make a proper Roosevelt Redware came and settled in this community sometime in the late 1300s. We have a lot of it there. Um, and um, so as you can see, um, we have people coming from all over the place, all through time. Now the last illustration I have here is of a dissertation project that is being begun by a, a student on the Homolavi project, uh, Claire Barker. And she is looking at, of all things, that darn corrugated pottery and how they corrugate. This is why I have graduate students. I don't want to do this, but I want to know what the results are. Um, and she has found two patterns here, and she's just beginning her, her actual analysis this last week. Um, she's going to look at about 3,000 uh, sherds from 3,000 different pots. Believe me, we have plenty. And she's found these two different styles from a, a pilot project she did a year ago. It looks like there are two different pottery making traditions about how you make, how you corrugate, how you make basically a corrugated pot, a utility, utilitarian pot that you used to cook and store food in. We'll see if this holds up. But this, the one on the left is uh, typical of what you find to the north up in the Hopi country. That's the way they make their pottery. That is the right way to do it up on the Hopi mesas. This is the right way you do it to the south and east where they made that brownware corrugated pottery. It's obliterated, corrugated, and they have all kinds of things going on. So we may have really good evidence and we may be able to get really good information about just how many people are involved, where they were living, how these two groups got along with each other and became integrated in these really large communities. So stay tuned. That's all. Thanks. All righty, as host, I get to ask the first question. Um, <clears throat> I, I am intrigued by the, uh, the finding of the Cochise and, and San Pedro points, along with the constellation of traits you'd normally associate with early agriculture and Rock Art Ranch. And it strikes me that uh, Rock Art Ranch is, is directly due north of Tucson. Are you ready to declare a San Pedro meridian? <laughs> Why not? Why not? Excellent. One of the interesting things, the Cortaro points, now I, I haven't done a total literature search, but they're about the first Cortaro points found outside of southeastern Arizona. Uh, and they began about 2000 BC, about 4,000 years ago. So that'll be really interesting. I need to do more work on that. But that's, those are good bona fides for suggesting really early movement. People really, early, early corn, maybe moving up into that area. Fascinating. So. Okay, we'll open the floor to questions. Again, if you don't feel like uh, asking a question out loud, write those questions down. I'll grab them as we go. And if you'll raise your hand, we can start with questions. Right here. When you say that agriculture came to Rock Art Ranch from Tucson, was, was Tucson a way station on that knowledge coming up from central Mexico, or was it a point of origin for that knowledge? Uh, no, it, it, it received it from what, probably western Me Mexico, definitely. Um, it's several thousand years older. Uh, the exact roots, we don't know, but there is a long tradition of contact between kind of western, west coast of Mexico, um, and that seems the most likely place. But yeah, it, it showed up here about 4,200 years ago, as far as we know now, which is pretty old. And it's basically older here than anywhere else that we know of. Next. Way in the back. I can't see that well. <laughs> Red shirt. Sorry. 
quick question, uh, and forgive my ignorance. Uh, the maze that you spoke of from 850 BC and 220 BC, is that indigenous or must it come up in the migration points? From the migration point. right no it, it's not indigenous to the plateau it it, it uh, as was the, the first question it originally originated in mexico uh, maybe six thousand to ten thousand years ago at least they were experimenting with a plant called tail uh, shows up in the <coughs> southwest what we call the southwest u.s two a little over two thousand years ago this is one of the earliest areas the reason it probably came up into the, this area is because it was a tropical plant. You know, it's coming from tropical areas, and so this is the closest thing to the tropics. I mean, it's warm here. If you have it, um, if you're watering it, this would be a good place for it to start. And then after they got accommodated to how to make it grow in this area, then the next step is is begin to, to disseminate. Uh, and two theories are it was it, one is it it was the knowledge just went and uh, and people borrowed plants and they took it. Uh, the second uh, diffusion. The second one would be migration. And for a long time, it was thought that diffusion better explained it. But we have such good evidence now that people were mig probably migrating with this knowledge. So the people brought that knowledge from this area up to the plateau, um, probably uh, about 3,500 years ago. It's the earliest evidence we have. Quick question. Um, how, is, how is the area around Rock Art Ranch in terms of preservation? I, I remember preservation in Amalavi was uh, for plant marine remains and such was just amazing. Is it the same around the Rock Art Ranch? No? No. We, we, it's better at the Multi-Kiva site. Um, there's a lot of caliche pretty close to the surface. There's a little pueblo that... that uh, Vin, Vin Lamada, uh, another uh, former graduate student myself and uh, Doug overlapped a little bit with. Um, he's at the University of Illinois, Chicago, and he's coming down and doing some excavations at some, some small pueblos. The Mulaby sites, we have the tiniest fish bones preserved, the tiniest um, immature animal. Everything is preserved. <laughs> At, at this little site we called, uh, well, site two, um, we were astounded that there was, we found no bone. So we, we brought Nancy Odegaard up. Werner, did you come up with her on that trip or maybe no, not? No. Anyway, we brought her up because we thought it's gotta be a, a preservation issue. And the soils are so alkaline there. You know, an alkaline soil, if it's not too alkaline, preserves bone, but if it's seriously alkaline, it eats it up. And so the soil was eating up the bone. The other explanation is that these people were vegetarians. <laughs> yeah. Not likely, not likely, so. Okay, I've got another question all the way in the back. Um, you said that there's, um, uh, you don't know why uh, there was uh, periods when there wasn't anybody living in this, in this particular area. Can you correlate that period with anything else in the region? You know, were, when were there, because there were other times when, other places when there weren't, people moved out of an area or weren't there or something. How does this correlate chronologically with other parts of the Southwest? Yeah, the, the main uh, period where we don't have people living in, in really in either area is a period that in the biggest classification is called Pueblo One and in early Pueblo Two. So that 800 to the 1000s period. Um, the, uh, if you go up around the Hopi area, where the Hopi, Hopi villages are today, um, and there are areas in southwest Colorado and, nor and southeastern Utah, there are enormous <coughs> Pueblo One communities in those areas. What was going on in Pueblo One is that there was a, a, a really extended dry period, drought period, and accompanying that was a lot of erosion so we see a lot of the, uh, and this has been reconstructed by um, people uh, correlating the tree ring record to um, um, alluvial deposits in these areas. And Eric may correct me if, I, if he wishes to, uh, but we, we seem to see a lot of erosion taking place in a lot of areas during this period in the, in the late 700s into the 800s, causing, at least the, the theory is, causing a lot of these areas to not be very, 
suitable for people to live in. So what people did is they moved into areas that were suitable and they aggregated, congregated in those areas. So we have settlements in South, well, in these three areas I just described that have hundreds and hundreds of rooms, hundreds and hundreds of rooms in the seven and eight hundreds. When, you know, the period before you were lucky to get, you know, 20 pit houses together, that was a huge community. So it seems like the period that we're, where we're missing people, those people have gone up into the, uh, probably around the, the Hopi area. Some may have gone up into the mountains too, to the south. And maybe that's why we have people coming back uh, with brownware pottery later on. So, uh, so they're, they're also to the east, they're also big Pueblo one communities over in the Zuni area uh, and a little better watered areas. So higher elevation, better watered areas where we tend to see these big communities. Okay, another question? Over here. Can you see any change in the corn as it moves up? In other words, grains of corn, <laughs> size or what looks like different varieties? Um, we, our sample size, we don't see that, but in, a, in the general scheme of things, yes. Uh, um, there's a new variety of corn. It's an eight road corn that begins to show up. The, the, the wonderful thing about corn, maize, is its genetic malleability. That is why we have so darn much of it in our, in our food supply. Mostly it goes into the meat, uh, but you know, we get some of it. Um, but it's so genetically malleable. And uh, so you can, so the reason that you find it all over U.S. indigenously and in Mexico is because it adapted to drier and drier conditions. So it starts off as a tropical plant and within 2,000 years or so, people are growing it on the Colorado Plateau, which is really cold and really dry compared to what it is in the Valley of Mexico. So we see a lot of changes um, in the number of ears, uh, the number of rows, and then also it slowly gets larger and larger and larger. So the, the early ones are, you know, tiny, tiny little ears of corn. What we, you know, what we see in pickled in jars now, that's about what they look like. And, and now, of course, uh, Native American corn is the, is the same size as ours. Um, so, yeah, so by the time it's showing up in the Rock Art Ranch area, well, it's probably this big. Any other questions? Right this way. In 1250, when Hamalavi actually started growing, Colorado Plateau was in full abandonment. Aztec just collapsed. The brutality and, and the roving gangs were unbelievable. And this settlement starts and grows. How does that work? Who were those people? My discussion tried to highlight that the, the people primarily who were living along the, in those Pueblos, the Homolavi Pueblos, were people who came down from the Hopi Mesas on the basis of the type of pottery and the way they designed their pottery, religious structures, the way they built their Pueblos and the domestic spaces. Um, part of the reason I think that they did that is because of the migrations that you were talking about. Um, those migrations probably started in the 1260s to, and then they just accelerated after that until most of the Four Corners was depopulated. I think that they moved down to the, at least initially to the Little Colorado River. There are five, well there's a, an early Pueblo and then about 1290, there are five Pueblos that are established. They're each three miles apart. Um, that, as I mentioned, that area wasn't occupied. I think the Hopi people settled that area to keep other migrant groups from settling in that area. It was a defensive move because it had water, they could grow cotton down there, there were all these amazing uh, plants and animals that are riparian plants and animals that the Hopi don't have and that they would go down to that area to collect historically and prehistorically. So my thinking is, is it was kind of a move to, to control that land and to gain access to those resources, which then could be taken back up to the Hopi Mesas. Uh, so I think that's why they did it. Uh, and then there were some migrants coming from other areas that did settle into that area. 
but mostly from the Hopi area. Okay, well, thank you very much, Chuck. Thank you. And um, just yesterday, our, our next issue of Archaeology Southwest was published, um, where a lot of these issues are, are actually discussed in some detail. Talking a little bit more about the Kayenta populations towards the Four Corners, but uh, Chuck's got an ar uh, article in there, and uh, you can read a lot more about these, these later traditions in, uh, in terms of migration and assimilation and emulation um, in that uh, new issue of Archaeology Southwest. And um, my wife is a little bit shy about it, but she's posted a, a blog post yesterday that talks a little bit more about the topics of uh, migration, assimilation, and uh, goes off into some popular culture ideas about assimilation <laughs> with the Borg and peanut butter cups and all sorts of interesting oh, things. So I highly oh. recommend giving that, giving that a read. I, I think you'll find it very interesting and very entertaining ways of explaining some of these topics. Um, our next cafe will be the first Tuesday in December and uh, TJ Ferguson from the School of Anthropology will be here uh, to talk about collaborations with indigenous communities.